So it's okay. a great pleasure yeah. to have Professor Justin David from Center of High Energy Physics, IISC Bangalore, in our 67th QS team webinar. He's going to speak about information theory in two dimension and CFT and uni its universal properties. So Justin, thank you for agreeing to give this talk. And uh, uh, this is 67 webinar, and we are wel welcoming you from here. Uh, so you can start from. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks, uh, Santan, for this invitation, yeah. Uh, actually, initially, I was reluctant, as Shantan will know, uh, because, you know, I, I thought I gave this talk already at some place, uh, some online forum, and people can just see it. But yeah, he said, no, no, the audience is different and so on. Yeah, so I'm happy to give this talk, actually. So uh, this is based on uh, some work, uh, information theory in 2D CFT. And uh, it was done earlier uh, by, with Barsha, who was one of my current students, and uh, Shavik, who, who was a student earlier, uh, who's at CERN now, uh, and, uh, and, and ongoing work with Barsha again. So this, uh, this ongoing work will be towards the end, and you know, it's not complete, so uh, there are gaps there. Um, we'll see when it comes to it. Okay, but what, since uh, Shantan told me, there are a lot of students and so on, uh, so what I will do is initially there will be a lot of a little bit of introduction and so on, uh, so the students can appreciate uh, at least uh, take away something, uh, uh, you know, uh, back and uh, you know they can do some calculations or at least know what are the basic uh, crux of the calculations. Okay, uh, so I, uh, how do I go to the next page? Is okay, maybe if I just click this, huh? So uh, I begin with an introduction. Uh, so, uh, you know, people just, you know, people in the subject already know that, you know, various information theoretic measures like entanglement entropy, relative entropy, we'll define some of them, uh, modular Hamiltonians, uh, trace square distance, I won't define that, but they, they play important role in this recent understanding of holography, quantum field theory, and uh, black hole physics. Um, and uh, what we will do in this is actually focus on very, uh, very simple uh, things. And, uh, you know, we'll use these information uh, theoretic properties, use these definitions to actually study simple properties uh, uh, in, in 2D CFTs. And uh, what is special about 2D CFTs is that 2D CFTs admit Virasero symmetry. And we want to know how these measures are sensitive to Virasero symmetry. And uh, I think this has not been explored very much. And uh, we would like to study that. Uh, and also, uh, for instance, this is a simple question. How does a single interval ent entanglement entropy of states create, created by primaries and descendants differ? I mean, you know, people study, for instance, most the most famous thing which is studied is the entanglement entropy of a single interval in vacuum. And that you get this famous formula C by three log, it goes logarithmically as the interval size. Uh, but, you know, less studied are the questions when, when the state is, when the CFT is excited uh, or when there is an excitation and a descendant and how they differ. Okay, uh, so let me, uh, uh, and there's another question related again to the same uh, thing. So 2D CFTs, uh, special to 2D CFTs are holomorphic conserved currents, uh, you know, like J of Z, the U1 current uh, there, it's holomorphic, uh, it, it obeys the current algebra. So suppose you have a CFT and then you deform the CFT by these currents uh, and uh, say you have a thermal density matrix, uh, then because the action is deformed, the Hamiltonian also gets deformed. And then uh, how, once you deform the CFT like this, how are information theoretic uh, measures uh, sensitive to such deformation? So these sort are of general questions, and uh, we will take them uh, formal, and we'll see how much results we get. I hope the questions are clear, uh, roughly. Uh, there is a Virasura symmetry. You want to see how these measures, like entanglement entropy, change under these uh, uh, symmetries of the CFT. Uh, so. Uh, and uh, when we study it, we will try to focus uh, in, it in such a way that we can extract certain properties which are universal to all CFTs uh, rather than very specific CFTs. 
Now, uh, first, before I go ahead, I have to, uh, you know, uh, study, uh, tell what are these measures and how to evaluate them. Uh, now, entanglement entropy, many people know it, but let me just go through the def definition again. Uh, so we consider a density matrix of a quantum system, uh, say partition it into two Hilbert spaces, disjoint uh, sets of commuting observables A and B. Okay, so say suppose we have a spin spin chain on a on a on a line, then you have spins at a particular region and the rest. So uh, so define a density reduced density matrix by tracing over the remaining uh, what you're not interested in, say the system B. And then entanglement entropy is just the von Neumann entropy of this reduced density matrix. And as I said, in quantum field theory or in lattice systems or spin systems, one chooses a region A uh, uh, and B as complementary to a spatial slice at a given time. Uh, like you have a line and then you choose an interval uh, as A and B as the rest of the uh, uh, domain. Uh, now, uh, to evaluate this, uh, you know, row A, log A, there's a log row A, that's pretty hard actually. So what people do is uh, they use something called the replica trick. It just relies on this identity. Uh, now, if you take row A to the N and take this particular limit, uh, you will get a trace uh, row A log row A. Uh, so because, you know, uh, row A to the N, if you Taylor series expand, there will be a log and uh, you can just work it out you will get, uh, you know, uh, trace rho a log rho a. So this is the identity. So essentially what you have to do is evaluate n powers of the reduced density matrix. Uh, and, uh, you know, and uh, somehow, uh, you know, once you have that, uh, you're in a position to evaluate entanglement entropy. Now, uh, so, uh, so here's a setup which we will be uh, focusing on for a while. Say, uh, take 2D CFTs on a cylinder, okay? And let's take O as a primary of holomorphic dimension, H, comma, zero. We can take holomorphic, anti-holomorphic, but just to simplify the matter, I've taken holomorphic dimensions of H, comma, zero. Then uh, the reduced density matrix is constructed by the following. So you take this, uh, the bra, act O, and then, you know, basically density matrix is like bra uh, and ket like that, no? I mean, you know, or ket bra, like uh, angle, angle. So here we create a state O and then we take a O dagger, okay? And trace over the B uh, region, region, okay? O dagger is uh, what is known in conformal field theory as B, PZ, or Belavin, Polyakov, Zamalchikov conjugate, but you can just think as O dagger, the dagger of this O, on zero. Usually, uh, what people are familiar with is when O is not inserted, meaning just a vacuum. Uh, but this is a slight generalization of that, uh, where O is inserted. Okay, the trace is taken over a spatial region, complement uh, to the region zero to pi x at a time slice to t equals zero. Now, let me show it in your picture. Uh, then it's easier to understand actually. So here is the picture. I hope uh, downstairs you can see. So this is a cylinder. Suppose you want to create a state in the CFT. In the cylinder picture, it is easy. You insert this phi, uh, the operator which is creating it, or phi or O, at t equals minus infinity. Evolve it to t is equal to zero. Okay, and the ket or the bra, uh, the dagger, the BPZ conjugate is created at t is equal to plus infinity and evolve backwards. And now when you take the trace, uh, uh, over the region B, meaning you trace over all these things which I have drawn here. This da, 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 that means this is the trace, huh? and you leave this untraced. You leave this untraced. So there's a little mouth between zero and two pi x. Okay, so this is of unit uh, two pi unit. I mean unit radius two pi. So the, uh, zero and two pi x. There is a little mouth because you are not traced over. You are not glued those cylinders. Okay. Now, uh, what you are allowed, you have to do is trace rho a to the n. So you have to take n, co n, uh, n copies of it somehow. You have to multiply rho a, uh, you know, n times. Now this is rho a. Okay? In picture, this is rho a. Okay? So if you want to take rho a to the n, you have to take another one. And because you know, you imagine rho a uh, i j, and then rho j k. So you have to sum over j. So you have to glue this part to another cylinder. Okay. Uh, so trace rho a to the n is given by n cylinders glued along this cut, okay? Because along the cut are the ij indices of the matrix, okay? 
So this is the picture, my drawings. I mean, I do uh, this computer drawings usually my students do. Where so I, yeah, I just did this. So so you hear. Uh, I hope everybody's hearing it, right? Uh, hello. Yes. 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 Everybody's hearing. Okay. So uh, so we have this little mouth zero to two pi x zero to two pi x, and then uh, you know you glue this end to another end, then up to the other lower mouth, up to the other lower mouth, and and come back all together again. That is the trace. So you have to have these end cylinders glued together. And then uh, you have phi, that operator, which creates that state at t is equal to minus infinity and t equals plus infinity on each of these cylinders. Okay, So that's what we have to do uh, uh, to evaluate trace rho a to the n. And once you are evaluated this, of course, you can evaluate the entanglement entropy. Now, of course, this look, <laughs> looks like a very complicated object to evaluate. So how do we simplify this whole thing? So this is the picture we have in path integral language. And how do we simplify it? So first, we can map the cylinder to the plane. Okay. So uh, this is the usual map. I think people who study conformal field theory, they know this map. You take e to the, uh, z e to the t plus i phi. So it maps the whole cylinder onto the plane. Okay, You can see t equals minus infinity maps to the origin. t equals plus infinity maps to the infinity. And this slice at t equals 0, you see t equals 0, the mod of that object is e to the i phi only. It's just a face. So it's mapped to the unit circle. Okay, And the interval is just a segment uh, to the on the circle. So the endpoints are 2, 2 pi x and v. So it's a segment on this unit circle. And this n branch planes are sued. Now it has become a plane picture, are sued over this uh, segment. So you see, this is the other picture. So we have these little, these unit circles. So there is a segment here. It's glued to this little mouth. One mouth is glued to that and, and so on. Sequentially, it's glued. Uh, and then uh, the whole thing is glued. It's hard to imagine. But yeah, this is the picture you have on the, uh, on the plane. So there are n branched planes. Now, this is also pretty hard to evaluate, actually. So then there is some map called the uniformizing map in which you, you, you actually uh, you know, uh, take each plane and make a wedge out of it. Okay? Uh, so uh, it comes, I think, in many things in string theory, such maps come. But uh, here, basically, you take this plane, and then you make a wedge. Okay, so, uh, so wedge of 2 pi n, 2 pi by n. So here is this map, uh, z minus u. u and v were the two locations of that, uh, you know, oper uh, of that operator. Okay, so you can see that, uh, or, or the places, yeah, places of that cut or wherever that, uh, you know, that segments on this uh, arc. So you can see z is equal to u, uh, it, this w, the uniformizing map becomes zero. And z is equal to v, it becomes infinity. So that little, that segment has become zero to infinity. Uh, and each, okay, uh, though it, it looks complicated, but uh, the final picture is actually simple. I will show you the final picture. Uh, each plane is mapped to a wedge of angle 2 pi n because of this 1 by n. It's like a square root. If, if imagine you learn in a complex analysis a square root map, so it, take, it basically makes the plane into half. So here, the 1 by n map makes it into 2 pi by n. And, uh, and then uh, you know, the operators, which were at 0 and infinity, are mapped to phases. So for instance, the infinity place is at e to the power 2 pi k by n, and the 0 is at this point. So let me show you the picture. And the intervals are on the bound. So let me show you the picture. Here is the picture. So now each of these planes is one wedge. OK, so each of these planes is one wedge. Uh, so uh, each of these planes is one wedge. And uh, the operators now have become on the segments. OK. Uh, it looks very, kind of, you know, very set, but this is the way, uh, this is the most uh, easiest way to evaluate this uh, partition function. So, uh, so here, the, the operators have become here, and the cuts, uh, entanglement cuts have become uh, these, this, these wavy lines which I have drawn. Okay, so now if you think about it in this picture, uh, it's basically, there is two N operators. Two n operators. You see, every cylinder had uh, two operators: one at zero and one at infinity. That cylinder, whole cylinder, has become this wedge. Uh, has become this wedge, uh, and and each of the wedges are these two operators uh, along the circle, along this unit circle. So therefore, there are two n 
to an uh, uh, you know operators on the circle so essentially the whole problem has been reduced to evaluating two end point function on the uniformized plane so it's a two end point function on the uniformized plane so it's a complicated object still but you know if you can evaluate the two end point function on the uniformized plane uh, then you can evaluate the entanglement entropy of excited states okay usually uh, most of the time what you hear is that uh, you don't put any of these insertions you just do the vacuum and that uh, if you uh, that if you do this uh, appropriately you will actually can show that it is c by 3 log uh, logarithmic uh, times the distance so this is the uh, basic object uh, for evaluating entanglement entropy of excited states um, so I hope that is clear. So essentially, this uh, so trace rate. Is, yes. I have a question. So as you have yes. said, it's a two-point yeah. function. So all right. these are like two-point, four-point, and so on. So yeah. what about? Yeah. So and then of course, once you evaluate that, you have to have a uh, you have to have an analytic form for that two endpoint function, and then take n going to one limit. Ah. Okay. Because you have to evaluate entanglement entropy, right? So let me show you that again. Um, yeah. So uh, we have just, sh just shown by the path integral and various mapping, this trace rho a to the n is a two endpoint function. Yeah, then you have to have that two endpoint function. So I'm just asking. And uh, then if I don't this, take the limit yeah. up to that point, uh, yeah, yeah. how to compute any kind of odd functions like three point, five point, and so on? Yeah, three point, five point don't come in this thing because you see the starting point is a cylinder with two operators already. Okay. okay. Right. And when you glue, always this two is there. It's a multiple of two all the time, actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In this, uh, in this whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, because there is a bra and a cat and uh, every time uh, there always are two appears things. like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Can I also ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. So if you could ba go back to your wedge. As wedge, as... Uh, the wedge, wedge. Okay. So there are three lines there. What is the third line? Third line, where is the third line? I mean, the, 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 the highest slope, yeah. This one? The, the, the higher slope. This the, one? Yes, yes. This is the second wedge. First wedge, this is one angle 2 pi by n, 2 pi by n, 2 pi by n, 2 pi by ah, n, like that. I see. I see. Yeah. And so, so the, the points of the operators, they, they, they appear two points at inside the wedge. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. The map, yeah, it was at zero and infinity on the cylinder, but it gets into this unit circle, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So this is the yeah. This is the correlation function you have to evaluate, and then uh, because you know everything was a conformal transformation, so when you have these primaries, uh, you know, uh, you know this uh, the conformal transformation. If you people are familiar with conformal transformation, uh, you know if W is uh, W was that uniformizing map, which was a conformal transformation, then W prime comes, you know, this is the way an operator transforms and the conformal transformation. The slope of the transformation to the power weight of the operator is there. Okay. So essentially you have to evaluate this correlation function with this. And for infinity, so there were one operator at zero and one operator at uh, infinity. The infinity, I think to take it convenient, you can put the BPZ uh, map here, which is like Z going to minus one by Z. So you put it there. And, and this is the particular transfer. So essentially, I have like I've shown that this object, this trace row to then this is a normalization is essentially this correlator. Okay, so if you can evaluate this correlator, given a CFT, if you can evaluate this two endpoint function correlator, uh, uh, it's hard, of course. Uh, we will show an exactly solvable case soon. Uh, uh, so. Uh, then you can evaluate entanglement entropy of an excited state. O is the operator which creates that state. So this is a two endpoint function of the operator O. There's a pair of O's at every wedge. I'm telling it in words now. And a trace rho A to the N is the partition function of the N sheeted. Okay, this is the normalization, uh, as I just said. That is without any insertion, it's just the normalization. So now, uh, if you just evaluate trace row a to the n without anything, uh, I haven't gone through, but I think people know many of them, is uh, you get this particular formula actually, uh, log sine pi x by pi epsilon. Um, and uh, this is the famous formula, but of course we now we are removing this part 
and finding you know what is the contributions of the excitations so uh, so uh, there's that is the entanglement entropy but then you know there's another concept called relative entropy and uh, this is actually you know that one uh, for instance had uh, depending on the cut a, yes yeah i have some small doubt here yeah we are doing two dimensional contoured field theory right right and, right 2d yeah and um, what did this cut off because any correlation we calculate in two dimensional contoured theory even yeah, for yeah. rational contoured theory etc yeah at the end we, we don't see any uh, cut off coming into picture. yeah yeah, yeah. so this is yeah this is just so that the dimensions come out correctly i mean you know uh, the sine pi x uh, this thing i mean okay here it doesn't matter actually yeah maybe here it doesn't matter certainly here it doesn't matter but uh, when you have like length alone uh, yeah. just length just so that the dimensions work out it should be dimensionless inside so uh, redefining a dimensionless quantity out of the dimension yeah 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 That's yeah just that yeah because it comes in yeah. the log we have to bring to yeah. it right right yeah that, that's just that yeah actually yeah epsilon does not have any physical meaning as far as your correlation functions are concerned right? yeah no no it doesn't have any yeah it doesn't okay. have yeah uh, so let's go ahead yeah so uh, yeah. i must ask another question from like yeah. so so this yeah. twist yeah. so the w is called twist operator is that w uh, where is, is w like? actually uh, uh, in the previous uh, yes no yes. this is just no no it's not the twist it's just the map it's the map uh, it's the uniformizing map which takes the plane to the 1 by n wedge yeah it's this that yeah yeah because you know uh, for any conform l trans any you know for if you do these such conformal transformations in a cft you have this w prime w prime you no know, the slopes of the transformation that comes yes. just like a tensor transformation yeah just like yes, yes 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 okay so uh, there's another concept which uh, you know many times when you read these papers you will see uh, so it's called uh, relative entropy now uh, it there it was that uh, entanglement entropy was just function of one density matrix right the reduced density matrix we took it to the power n and found some number out of it by taking the trace and taking limits uh, and going to one limit but here uh, this gives a single number given two density matrices so it's trace row log row minus uh, the other one log row two uh, so uh, and um, you know actually uh, this i found out while preparing for the stock only there's uh, there's this reference i mean you know one doesn't see witten's papers very much nowadays but i shouldn't even say this but but at one very point good. of time every, this is a very every, good introductory notes yeah yeah it's a very good introductory notes this one uh, and you know uh, he has a proof in a very simple way using just probability theory why such a quantity uh, will be positive actually i wouldn't be able to go through it but but if people are interested uh, people just can go through that and they will find out uh, you know they can find out why such a quantity is positive it looks non trivial because you know uh, two logs the difference and so on but it's always positive actually and and just since it's always positive it it can be used as a you know a measure of distance uh, between the two density matrices so realize it's a it's a more it's a quite a complicated quantity because the density matrix itself is a huge matrix and you know usually it's infinite dimensional if the, it is this quantum field theory and uh, we are talking about given two of these objects uh, returning a number so a number. Uh, what this distance corresponds to what why we need this actually right yeah so uh, this concept has been used uh, several i mean i wouldn't be able to apply but you can see something uh, towards the end why how it will be useful for applications but but one of the things is that it is used for Uh, you know proving uh, the you know center c theorem uh, it is used for proving you know the fact that uh, area theorem so such things uh, it is used i mean it has been used for giving information theoretic proofs of such quantities uh, i will so, uh, uh, like uh, uh, i have asked because there is a uh, thing people used to calculate which is a called circuit complexity and uh, is yeah. there a connection with that because there people used to define yeah. some kind of uh, distance function or cost function or cost function yeah that's a yeah. cost function 
yeah uh, for a circuit and then some yeah, yeah. i i don't know i don't know i don't think it is related to this you know because that depends on a con complete path yes uh, it depends on a complete path and some circuit and here's just a simple concept i mean much simpler than that given two density matrices okay. Uh, okay. you know what's what's uh, you know give a number it's it just this is a function which just gives you a number out of that and of course because of its property it's positive and therefore we can think that oh yeah it looks like a distance between the two okay. uh, actually thank you yeah so uh, so uh, let me get uh, some more intuition about this okay uh, so here uh, the algebra is not much but you know some intuition about this uh, quantity uh, since you also asked what it is but uh, let's get some intuition hmm? now uh, you know uh, so uh, a row is like you know you remember row is the density matrix and if you think about uh, think about uh, you know statistical mechanics you usually write rho is e to the power of minus beta h right uh, you write like that so therefore uh, just using that analogy you you can introduce some hamiltonian called modular hamiltonian which is basically a log rho the density matrix and take the log you see rho is e to the power of minus h okay there's no temperature because it's just density matrix and we just take the log of that and that's just by you know by uh, by the fact that you know in thermal density matrices when you take log of the density matrices you get uh, something proportional to the hamiltonian so here uh, this object it's a fundamental quantity information theory it's called the modular hamiltonian now just from this definition you can write uh, relative entropy in this manner you see uh, row 1 h2 minus trace row 1 h1 uh, h1 so you see let's look at the row 1 h1 term hmm? uh, so that is row 1 uh, log row 1 right because h1 is the you know h1 is log row 1 so that's row 1 log row 1 and let's go back and see um, you see row 1 log row 1 hmm? and then this row 1 log row 2 uh, so that is row 1 h2 so you can write it uh, just by this definition it's just a consequence of this definition like this but it it has an interpretation once you write it like this no this is like the expectation value of this hamiltonian in this density matrix expectation value of this hamiltonian in this density matrix so it has some meaning once you write it like that now it is a little bit clearer than the previous yeah 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 so uh, so then just from this identity rho h1 h2 is equal to Uh, you transfer this to the other side plus sign uh, so it is this row uh, row 1 uh, it's plus this so that's this just this written like this hmm? so therefore uh, if you want to evaluate so this is a technique of uh, evaluating modular hamiltonians actually if you want to evaluate expectation value of the modular hamiltonian h2 of row 2 associated with uh, row 2 in the state row 1 you can evaluate and if you and if you can evaluate you know relative entropy and the entanglement entropy you just have to add them uh, and then you will get this so this is just a consequence of identity and you want to evaluate modular hamiltonians uh, you can do this operation you but you need to know this and you need to know this and what we saw was that we we i gave you a formula how to compute entanglement entropy so once i give you this uh, we will know how to compute this also so uh, so and modular hamiltonians are also useful actually uh, again for those theorems uh, and so on uh, modular hamiltonians yeah in, in the definition of uh, relative entropy yeah. so the right hand side is trace rho 1 h2 minus no no if you go back yeah. to the yeah side, yeah this one is it rho 1 h2 or rho 2 h2 rho 1 h2 because you see uh, i'll tell you why uh, because this row 1 is outside here see row 1 yeah log row 2 okay row 1 log row. it's like a cross term this this one is like row it's actually row 1 log row 1 by row 2 another way of saying it row 1 divided by row 2 yeah. otherwise it it will not be relative it will it will be the yeah. difference of the two in two entropies yeah. yeah okay fine yeah thanks yeah so okay so that is this Uh, okay now actually this is the more physical intuition of this relative entropy actually once you write it like that it has a meaning in terms of uh, free energy hmm? let's uh, see that again okay so uh, row 1 uh, row so uh, let's define this first this quantity hmm? uh, f row 1 row 
So which is like the free energy. I just want to define something which is very close to the free energy. Uh, so uh, this is uh, basically the expectation value of this Hamiltonian H2 associated with row two uh, in row one density matrix. So this quantity minus S of row one itself. Okay. So this is the free energy of row two with respect to a state row one. Uh, so the analogy comes from this. You see, this is like expectation value of energy. Okay. In the state row one, of course, in the state row one. So that's E. Okay. And uh, this is T is one because the Hamiltonian was defined with beta equals one. Okay. Uh, whatever uh, that uh, is one. So this is like S. So E minus T S. So if you see, that's the analogy. E minus T S. That is the analogy. Uh, and then, uh, so therefore, and S row one, you know, is of course, this is the definition of S row one minus trace low, row log row one, which is row one H one. And if you just use this definitions, actually, if you just use this definition, just take this definition, you will see that the relative entropy is actually between state row one and row two uh, is actually the difference in the free energies. Uh, in this, if once you define it, it's the difference in the free energies between row two and row one evaluated in the state row one. So, uh, so that if you rewrite it in this way, uh, uh, so a relative entropy is actually a difference in the free energy and um, uh, it's analogous to this, you know, free energy in a thermodynamical system with this density matrix uh, and the positivity of relative entropy is analogous to the system that uh, statement that you know the minimum value of the free energy is achieved when the system achieves equilibrium so when row two is equal to row one uh, it vanishes and that's the minimum because it's always this object is always positive okay. so uh, i think here some algebra is there but i think people can go home and it's very simple you can just take this fellow uh, and substitute it here and you will go, it will go back to the original definition actually. Yeah. And so relative entropy is basically a difference in the free energy in, defined in this manner. And this we will use slightly. Okay. Uh, and now uh, I, what, as I said before, if I give you a formula how to evaluate uh, the relative entropy, then everything is complete. Then you, know, you can evaluate modular Hamiltonians, you can evaluate differences in free energy and so on. So uh, essentially I'll have to give this. And there is a method of uh, that, again, using the replica trick. You remember it was trace. Uh, so we had to take a row one, log row one. And that is obtained by the replica trick, this log trace row one to the n. If you take n, you know, uh, n going to one limit in this, you'll get this. Now here, uh, that row one, uh, log row two. And that uh, you just have to put row one, row to the row to the n minus one. And if you take Taylor series expand around n equals one, you will get that. Okay. So this uh, this uh, identity will help us to, and we, we just have to go back to the path integral using this identity, and we'll get uh, a way of evaluating the uh, relative entropy. So relative entropy is basically this quantity, this density matrices. Uh, taken n going to one limit. Uh, recall this one is the same as what we did before, uh, uh, row one to the n, because that was row one log row one. And this one is slightly different, which I will say. So e, there is one row one and uh, n minus one row two. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, so let us give this again the canonical thing. I'm actually looking at this canonical stuff again. Row one is the density operator. Uh, density matrix correspond of an interval corresponding to the operator O1. So this is what I've been talking about all the time. We put operators at the cylinder uh, at the top and the bottom and trace over everything except that little mouth. That's the row one. Now you put another operator uh, at uh, the ends of the cylinder and trace over the, uh, the mouth. I mean, uh, only little uh, one of the mouths is open. That's row two. Okay. And essentially now I want this object, how to, how to write this as a path integral or a correlation function eventually. Okay. Uh, so here, so if you go through the same picture, it's very simple, you can see that there are these n cylinders in, in n minus one of them, there is the O1 uh, or O2, sorry, O2. <laughs> this is O2, O2, oh, I see this is wrong, O2, because you see uh, n minus one of them has row two and the last one has row one. 
actually I, yeah. Oh yeah, here is the O1 and okay. And here is the, all the N minus one O2s. So there are N minus one O2s uh, and the uh, one of them has a uh, row one. So this, and if you go through the same logic of mapping it on the, onto, the, uh, onto the planes and then onto the wedge, you will basically get a, a two end point function again, but in one of the wedges, there will be O1 uh, and uh, two O1s. Uh, and in the other N minus ones, there will be uh, uh, O2s. So that uh, is this correlation. So you go through the same in terms of the correlator on the uniformized plane. We see that in one of the wedges, there is this O1, two point, and the other one, uh, there is uh, O2s. I hope that is okay. So, so this is the recipe. So we have two we have these both quantities, these both correlators, and once we have both of these correlators, uh, the relative entropy is basically a ratio of these objects, and n going to one limit. Uh, and of course, whatever that dimensional dependence uh, just disappears when you do these things. Actually, yeah. So, uh, so the relative entropy is given in terms of the ratio of these two endpoint functions. Okay, so this is sort of the recipe for evaluating. So in a theory, if you know how to do this, uh, then you can indeed evaluate relative entropy, modular Hamiltonians, uh, and uh, you know the differences in free energy, all of those information theoretic quantities. There's one more I didn't talk about, uh, this square, distance squared or something. But it's okay. It's all related to this. You can relate this to that. So, so essentially, this very complicated information theoretic quantities have been mapped to just correlation functions, which, as as physicists, we are more familiar with actually. So, uh, now let me illustrate it with a simple example, huh? which I think many people know. Uh, this example. So, a free scalar, uh, just free boson x c equals one, uh, conformal field theory. And the primary is e to the i l x. L is the number x. And this is people who are uh, knowing string theory. This is like the tachyon operator. It, uh, but this is the operator e to the i l x. Its dimension is l squared by 2. Okay, That's the dimension of this, uh, uh, the weight of this. So, so, And the state I'm creating is this e to the i l x uh, here. And this, this is the thing, state. And what we require is the 2 endpoint function. Okay. Uh, and that is known. I mean, uh, this operator, I think people who are familiar with uh, free CFTs um, or even old string theory, uh, they know that you know you can evaluate endpoint function of this tachyon operator. Okay, so that uh, is known, and that is this answer. It looks complicated, but it's not complicated. It's just sort of products. Essentially, when we contract these two, we get logs, and and that becomes powers because it's in the exponent. Um, so it's some particular function. Actually, and there is a way of writing it. Then, uh, as you remember the recipe, you need the two endpoint functions. You also need the slopes of the conformal transformation. You have to do this OP kind of thing here. Uh, OP, yeah, uh, that is one way. But you, the, the, you, I think these correlation functions are known. Uh, OP is one way. Yeah, xx is actually log here. Uh, and uh, the log is appearing in the exponent. And that's why there is. I L into minus I L that's like a L squared log. Yes. And that's how this L squared thing comes actually. Mm -hmm. And the log, uh, because it's log, it becomes powers of the differences actually. So there is a, it's this correlation functions are known and you can use the OP method to evaluate it actually evaluate this correlation functions. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so this is an exactly solvable model. I mean, that's why, uh, that's the reason this two endpoint functions can be evaluated, but it's quite boring. You'll see it's quite boring soon, actually. So, um, uh, so this is uh, evaluated and then we need the Jacobians involved in the conformal transformation or the slopes of that, you know, W map, that uniformizing map at zero and infinity. And uh, that can be evaluated that that is this. Okay, you see the distance x is coming into those things because the map depended on little u and little v, which had this distance, and um, and then uh, if if you go through this whole algebra, you know it's a complicated function. You have to fold it. Okay, let me just again illustrate it, uh, the non-trivialness of this. This is a complicated function. Then you have these slopes, and then uh, let me show it to you again. Uh, that formula. 
yeah, then you have to put these slopes here and then these correlators uh, and do and substitute that correlator, substitute the slopes. And then uh, various identities are there, uh, end roots of identities are there. And you use all that, you use all that, you actually uh, get a, a sort of boring result <laughs> that somehow for this free theory, uh, uh, this excitation, uh, you know, excitation does not, it's not, uh, uh, you know, it, when you compare it with the vacuum, uh, it's identical. There's no extra entanglement you create. Uh, with this, I, I, it's because it's a free theory, uh, and uh, somehow there is no entanglement for this. So, so that, but I, I have yeah. one question here. Yeah. So, uh, till now, you have uh, so your talk is only based on two D CFDs. Right, right, right. But what happened if you consider the other uh, dimen uh, higher dimensional CFDs? Like CFDs. Yeah. yeah, you can't evaluate this two endpoint function actually. Even yeah. the free limit, it's pretty hard. Because you know these maps don't exist. Yes. These maps are because of the conformal uh, transformation. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, it's quite difficult actually to do that. Even here, it's only for this exactly solvable sort of model you can do, like a free a boson, free fermion. Uh, you know where you know the two endpoint function you can do. But I will show you some approximation techniques soon, and those things can be extended actually to uh, to higher dimensional CFTs actually. Uh, but this exact calculation of two endpoint functions, yeah, that 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 is not very easy to do. But and this maps also are true. Uh, you cannot uh, yeah do these maps also. Uh, and you know uh, like here, just knowing the plane correlator, you can find the correlators on these wedges on those cones because of the maps. Okay, but you can't do that in a higher dimensional CFT. Actually, usually you know flat space correlators. Um, so it's pretty hard. Uh, these questions are quite hard. I mean, people talk about various things and holography and all, but uh, but you know, when you ask the question a little bit more detail, I think it's pretty hard actually. Many quantities in this entanglement business is pretty hard to evaluate. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead. Uh, uh, so actually, you can do this thing for the relative entropy, and if you do this, uh, you will get the. I mean, the relative entropy between rho e to the chi ix and the vacuum you get this particular function okay. uh, just in just a, uh, yes yeah in the previous transparency yeah. so we found that this there is no entanglement of uh, this, yeah uh, pp to the power i l x yeah i l x yeah but suppose i would have gone to the next uh, secondary state like l x ah i will do that i will do that good <laughs> that is one thing which i'm proud of, which we did so i will do it soon actually okay. yeah, i'll do it yeah i'll do it yeah Good, <laughs> yeah, anticipated. So, uh, yeah, so uh, so the relative entropy between this and the vacuum, uh, you can calculate again because when you have to relative entropy, you have one correlator which is different, and and uh, you know one of the wedges had different object. One of the vector had vacuum, or uh, n minus one had this, and one of them had vacuum, and then it turns out to be this. This is a sort of nice thing to remember. It keeps appearing all the time. Uh, and uh, as we saw that the sum of the entanglement entropy and the relative entropy relates the expectation value of the model Hamilton. That was one of the identities. So you can evaluate that. You just have to add this to the entanglement, which was zero. So it is that. You can also evaluate like between L and L prime, which is like distance between these two states. Uh, it gives, basically it is giving proportion. You see, it's, uh, it's a, this is a positive function. And uh, it's uh, L squared. Uh, it's the difference between the weights, uh, L minus L prime, roughly proportional to the distance between the weights. Okay. Now, uh, so actually, I will come back to the del x question, del it a little bit later. Okay. Uh, so towards the end, I will come back because that is one of the ongoing things. So I, I'll come. That is part of the ongoing thing. So I'll come to this. Uh, and so I will. Uh, right now, I'll focus on. Uh, again, relative entropy, but uh, another way of evaluating it, which is uh, useful in a different way. So actually, I'm really like slow. I don't know even the time. Uh, no, you, you, you are perfect, actually. Uh, OK, I'm perfect. OK, yeah. Okay. Uh, so speed is OK, right? I mean, speed is fine. Okay. It's absolutely OK. Yeah, you can, yeah. So, uh, so again, we'll talk about relative entropy, but a slightly different way of evaluating it, which was developed by Myers and all. Uh, and in some context, it becomes easier, actually. I'll, I'll show you uh, that. And there are some applications to that. Uh, and this was the part of the first paper. 
uh, with Basha and Shavik. So, uh, so here it is. Uh, so another it relies on another identity actually of the relative entropy. As the relative entropy definition is the same: rho one log rho one uh, minus uh, trace rho one uh, log rho two. And you can get that another way also. Like you put rho one to the alpha, rho one to the one minus alpha, and alpha minus one alpha going to one limit. Uh, like again, you if you expand this. Uh, uh, and go ahead. You will uh, you you will get this particular thing. And here, row one and row two, everything is normalized to one. Trace row is one. And uh, again, if you this minus will give you the minus sign actually when you take the limit alpha going to one. So uh, uh, so that's how uh, how this uh, this is another way of doing it. But here you see row one to the alpha and one minus alpha. So it's like a fraction kind of thing, uh, and that has a nice way of. Uh, uh, you know, path integral, slightly different path integral representation, which is easier, and uh, and that representation uh, is called Euclidean quench by these guys, uh, uh, and um, I will show you that now. So it's basically the two density matrices, uh, one to the power alpha and one to the power one minus alpha, and somehow you have to take the trace. So this doesn't involve a correlation for certain cases. Hmm? So I, I will show you that uh, thing. So, uh, and especially when you choose the density matrices like this, so it's easier to use this uh, to evaluate. So take row two, uh, which is uh, which is one minus alpha this part, uh, to be the thermal density matrix itself, e to the minus beta h, and row one is a deformation of the thermal density matrix. So take h plus this. This was the second class of problems I was talking about. That you know you take the action, you deform it. By uh, see, by this thing, uh, by a holomorphic current. Uh, so uh, row one and uh, and then how can I represent this as a path integral? Okay, uh, so that I can calculate this uh, uh, this quantity and then take alpha going to one limit. So here it is. So in one part of the Hamiltonian, I just want to ask that is there yeah. a restriction in the deformation parameter mu? In this mu. Uh, uh, well, in some cases there will be, as you will see eventually. Uh, but right now it's a perturbative parameter. Uh, okay. you, it's small, and then you, you know the, the way we are going to handle this evaluation is by perturbation theory. So mm -hmm. perturbation theory should be valid. Uh, but there will be, you'll see soon there will be. Uh, we can if you can sum up the perturbation theory, there will be restrictions on you. Okay. Actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. So one Hamiltonian, one part of the Hamiltonian rho, rho e to the power of beta h is the undeformed, this blue shade uh, one that is uh, for one minus alpha beta, because that is raised to the power of one minus alpha. So if you put rho beta and put one minus alpha, so that has one minus alpha. And the deformed one, okay, is alpha, okay. So uh, it's a fraction of the beta. So it's a cylinder. So when you take the trace, you take the trace over this thing. It's a cylinder in which one part of it is with the Hamiltonian H prime, the deformed one, and another one is just the HCFT. HCFT. So uh, so that is, and if you take this trace, uh, uh, you will get uh, that rho to the alpha and one minus alpha. And taking the limits, you can evaluate the relative entropy. So essentially, you have to evaluate this path integral in which the theory is deformed in this. Uh, brownish shade and uh, undeformed in the other shade I think. so that it's called a quench because you have changed the hamiltonian for one but it's euclidean quench it's not time <laughs> it's the uh, it's euclidean time uh, quench actually. so i think the myers and all introduced this and they introduced it for a specific purpose which i will briefly mention soon uh, now uh, so the path integral this is in words uh, any questions again uh, the path integral on thermal cylinder with hcft deformed by the operator j is uh, is basically you have to perform that, and uh, it's it's coupled. The deformation is coupled. You can think of it as a time dependent, uh, uh, you know, uh, source, because uh, in the deformation is switched on uh, for this Euclidean time, and then switched off, uh, which you can write as this as a theta function, which is turned on, and then switched off. Okay. So, uh, uh, so it's a way of writing. So you switched on the Hamiltonian and switch it off. Um, um, 
So if you can do that, then you can calculate. So what all you need to normalize, we need trace of rho e to the, you need this computation. So you need to know this particular, the usual one trace. You need the one with the deformed. You need to know how to calculate this deformed one because you have to again normalize it. And you need to know this path integral in which partly it's switched on, at, uh, it's switched on and then switched off with this current source J. So you need to know this path integral. So if you can calculate all these, uh, you just have to you know, uh, substitute it in this object it's just for the normalization. Uh, and uh, uh, and you, know, you can evaluate it in a divergence. But now you have, and uh, if mu is small, you can actually do perturbation theory. So you have converted that the other problem, at least for these classes of density matrices, the problem of evaluating two endpoint functions to perturbation theory, conformal perturbation theory. So this uh, allows us to handle uh, evaluate relative entropy for a different class of problems actually by this perturbation theory. Um, so there are exactly solved. This is what our uh, work was. Uh, somehow Myers did not have an exactly solvable problem. Uh, actually, we found a class of exactly solvable problems, uh, which I will show. And there is some use to it, uh, some little use. Uh, I will tell you that uh, soon. Um, uh, so uh, suppose the operator J commutes with the Hamiltonian. Uh, the deformation commutes with the Hamiltonian. Say J is a conserved current. Huh? So it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Then rho to the alpha, rho to the one minus alpha, I mean rho prime actually, <laughs> rho, rho prime to the one minus alpha uh, is, uh, if you think about it, it's just a path integral with the mu uh, turned on for only alpha time. Okay, so. So, because you can put them together, I mean, you, basically you can put this whole thing together because rho and rho prime commute, you don't have to ordering problems, you can raise it together. And uh, so it's basically that uh, that chemical potential is turned on only, only uh, you know, only along, only for alpha time. Uh, so, so thus, if you know the path integral with, with the operator J turned on, all you have to do is scale mu, and then we can evaluate Rene divergence. So this happens when J commutes with the Hamiltonian so that we can put them together. We can actually, this is rho prime, I shouldn't have written like that. It's rho to the alpha, rho prime, where is the deformed one. Rho prime uh, is the deformed rho. So, uh, so then you can do that. Uh, so there are models like that actually. So all these deformations with conserved currents, okay, J is the U1, uh, it commutes, if J is the U1, it means it's conserved, so it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, stress tensor, of course, commutes to the Hamiltonian. It's part of the Hamiltonian itself. And like higher spin currents, okay? If, the, if it has a higher spin symmetry, it commutes to the Hamiltonian. So, uh, so all these deformations, actually, uh, we can calculate in this technique. And for instance, for, for the U1 current, okay, the answer is a little boring, but, but still, this is the exact answer, actually, for that uh, Rene divergence, the alpha parameter object. Uh, this is the exact uh, uh, answer, and uh, uh, and all it depends on is this OPE of the JJ current. Okay, uh, and um, for uh, for stress tensor, a little bit more interesting. Now, uh, this is mu actually. <laughs> so this uh, deformation of the stress tensor actually, when you deform this theory by a stress tensor, it's natural. I mean, because stress tensor is like uh, shifting the energy. Uh, so it actually shifts the temperature. You can show that uh, by perturbation theory, you can show that deforming this action uh, action uh, by stress tensor, by holomorphic perturbation theory you have to do, it actually, uh, and evaluate the partition function, you can actually show that the temperature shifts like this. So beta prime uh, is related to beta with one minus two pi uh, mu t. Okay? And here is where, as I think Shantan asked this bound, perturbation theory, are they restricted? So here you can see there's a restriction, but this has happened only when we summed up, we summed up the whole thing and that's that's how summed up the whole perturbation theory and that's how we could notice this, that it shifts temperature like this. And um, uh, so it, there we found, yeah, yes. I have a question yeah. now here. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting confused uh, yes. a bit. Uh, what is this, what are you referring at the size of the system? What do you mean by the size of the system here? Size so uh, spatial length is uh, infinite actually. L compared to the size of the system, I'm getting confused. That what is the size? What system we are considering? That uh, there is something referred by the size of the system. Uh, 
uh, where did I write size? Yeah, so actually this entanglement, okay, so for instance, here I'm not considering an interval, okay, if you're thinking about that old problem, there's, there was an interval, single interval, and uh, and then we found out the entanglement entropy uh, depending on the size. Here, in this one is slightly different problem, in which right. we have uh, two it's density right. matrices, just two it's density, it's one is... Uh, size, this, this spatial length is infinite, actually. Yeah. It's infinite. So, so, so yeah. at the end, you will take again L going to infinite limit? Yeah, L going to, this is temperature and L going yeah. to infinity limit. So we'll have to evaluate densities only. Okay, so at present like, you are considering the length of the cylinder is capital L. L, yes. Our final yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, L, <laughs> size of, this. oh, that's why you asked. Yeah, L, yeah, yeah. And then uh, we take the size to infinity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, eventually, yeah. So that that spatial length is the L. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, I wrote this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. So here, yeah, yeah, here it's coming L. Yeah, you can see that pi CL by six beta is the usual free energy kind of dependence of uh, CFTs. Uh, so L by beta. Uh, yeah. So that uh, is coming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, extensive size L. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so this. Uh, thing uh, where you sh add the sh temperature, where you add the what is it called, the stress tensor. It shifts the temperature, and you can in fact evaluate the distance between uh, rho, which is deformed by mu, and uh, undeformed temperature. So you can write it actually in the two different temperatures, T prime, which is related one by T prime. So it gives you some uh, distance measure. Again, it's positive between. Uh, Two density matrices at different temperatures, okay. um, uh, uh, and similarly, you can do spin-free deformation, and um, uh, there is a formula actually. Uh, these all this we can get from perturbation theory actually, uh, uh, and in principle, every term in the series uh, we can calculate actually. It's known, uh, and um, there is a perturbation theory to this. Now, what is the use of it? Actually, what we were motivated uh, by calculating, we wanted these exactly solvable just problems. A second, just a second. Uh, can I check now about what I understand? Yeah. Uh, basically, this length of the cylinder, because we are now doing this uh, quantization uh, in going in the, the time, the time, the length time of the, cylinder, the time direction, Euclidean time direction in this case. Yeah. Consider now for a system for a give, give a definite time interval from zero to capital L, but at the yeah. end this time has to go to it is not the it is not the uh, special size it is the time you have evolved the system from let's say time zero Euclid and time, time equal from zero to some time up to capital L, and then you will take you will take it up to infinite time. Is this no? Uh, actually, oh, maybe uh, yeah. If, uh, maybe I have been very confused. So the length is L. So this is the length. Okay, from my cursor you can see. Sorry, uh, this is the length L. The L. Okay. The, uh, this this side is the length, and this is where the beta is. So the 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 circumference is our time direction. Yeah, circumference is the time direction. So that 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 is Euclidean time. Because uh, you are evaluating at finite temperature, and part of the finite temperature there is one Hamiltonian, and part of it is another Hamiltonian. Okay, now so, now what, what I was looking at that when we map it to the plane, like we do in two-dimensional uh -huh. yeah. to, to the plane, yeah. then this will be this our uh, what it is called. Uh, uh, angular quantization or whatever. Yeah, yeah, do. yeah. You can do that, but you know, in this problem, this set of problems, which is slightly easier. So all we do is keep evaluating the cylinder all the time. We stick like that, trace e to the power of minus beta h. Huh. Uh, we don't map it to the cylinder, or because it's easier actually. We don't need to do the two endpoint function. Okay. So we just uh, you see the partition when trace of e to the power of minus beta h is the original CFT. Yeah. Okay, maybe I went here very fast. And trace of this deformed one is the H plus mu. So that is the original CFT plus the mu. And now when we have this particular thing, partly uh, traced, uh, partly the one row uh, and the other one is the usual thermal, then you have the CFT deformed with this, but it is switched on, this deformation is switched on and switched off by this theta function. So all these are cylinder partition functions actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, all these are cylinders, so you just have to keep evaluating this. And uh, to evaluate this, you bring it down in perturbation theory. You, you 
you keep this and keep perturbing it, bring it down, like e to the lambda phi, just keep bringing it down. And that's how we evaluate it in perturbation theory. Uh, so we just keep but, bringing uh, it. Again, uh, yeah. you hear Soma, when you write this, you are assuming that, see, generally two dimensional component field theory, at least a class of that, we yeah. need not know about the action of the theory. But here right, you right. Yeah. know the action of the theory if you want to compare these two. Yeah, no, actually, finally, uh, I'm writing it so that you, it is understandable in a field theoretic way. So but when you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah when you bring it down, we just have to take correlation functions of this JJ, right? Perfect. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is just so that uh, one understands. <laughs> but actually, when you bring it down, we just have to evaluate correlation function on the cylinder, J, 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 exactly. like that. Yeah. Yeah, so I have not shown the details of the, but yeah, it will become very busy when I show this. Yeah, essentially you keep bringing it down. So uh, that's why this correlation function is important, the basic two-point function, yeah. So, and similarly in this case, the basic two-point function of the stress tensor, TT correlation functions are important uh, to evaluate this. And that is known and it's universal actually. Um, so, uh, so, so this has this measure. And uh, similarly, higher spin, WW, uh, like those correlation functions are used to evaluate these things. Uh, you have to, actually, it's a little, I mean, I should say the involve, uh, involvement in that. So uh, as I said, you have to bring these things down uh, when you evaluate it. Uh, so there is two Js, for instance, at the first order in perturbation theory. And then there is an integral over the cylinder. So you'll have to perform those things actually. And in the paper it is done and you have to perform those uh, integrals. Then if you have four insertions like that, you have to perform four integrals. Uh, so uh, all that uh, can be done actually for such classes of holomorphic. That holomorphic plays a very important role when we do these things. So uh, yeah, so what is it used for? Actually, why we were motivated to find these examples uh, is the following actually. Uh, it's this connection of the relative entropy, which is this, it's just called D here because another way, uh, another symbol, but uh, to, uh, to that free energy, okay? Uh, you remember that relative entropy was like the free energy difference between the two things. Now, now here, as so alpha equals one was the relative, relative entropy uh, and that was the difference in free energy. Now alpha is general, I mean, uh, it's a general thing or N, uh, it's general one. So now uh, what Myers and those people, and in fact, motivated by information theory uh, ideas, uh, they postulated that, you know, actually we should, alpha equals one is free energy, but, uh, minimization of the free energy principle. But they postulated that, you know, uh, for any transition to go from one density matrix rho one to rho beta, to the thermal density matrix can occur only if that rho one uh, free energy is higher than rho two. Okay, for all alpha, not just alpha equals one, where it has a connection with free energy. Okay, uh, so they wanted this to be true for all alpha, uh, and only then a transition is allowed. Uh, a transition from you know uh, rho one to rho beta in any non-equilibrium process, not just equilibrium, uh, any non-equilibrium process. Uh, a transition from rho one to from one density matrix to another. Uh, is allowed only when this object uh, to row two is allowed when you know when when you have it positive for all alpha, not just alpha equals one. So, <clears throat> that case, just in that case, I yeah. thought alpha should be some physical, physically explainable quantity. Do they explain yeah. what could be alpha? Yeah, alpha? yeah. No, they didn't have anything. They just like because they they you know this thing is just a generalization of uh, alpha yeah. equals one, which is the free energy. Uh, yeah. They said, that, yeah, no, we, 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 I mean, this is a more general quantity and That's they right. have to minimize it uh, with all alphas. But there was, uh, yeah, maybe they had some information theory uh, ideas for it. I, I don't understand that very much. Actually. People can tell something about the role of alpha in general. Yeah. It connected yeah, yeah. Some, something. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they might tell, yeah, but I, 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 yeah, I didn't know. Actually, so we were motivated uh, to find these exactly solvable examples because here you can test this actually, this, uh, yeah. uh, what Myers had, uh, he couldn't, he had only perturbative, uh, you know, he deformed it by just an operator of dimension delta, but we had this holomorphic currents where he could calculate it exactly. And we could see that if alpha equals one, okay, is minimizing. But suppose we minimize between all alphas, is there a stronger constraint? 
yes. than the usual laws of thermodynamics. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we wanted to study. But still, and, we are assuming that alpha goes from zero to one, right? Yeah. At it least in these calculations, you can do only that uh, yeah. because uh, it's that cylinder, and part of it is alpha, and the yes. fraction of it is alpha. Yeah. But in principle, you're supposed to be able to do, but this way of setting up that calculation of that complicated quantity allows you only from alpha zero to one. Yeah. You can go for negative alpha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they want it to everywhere, actually. They want to minimize it to anywhere. But even if you find some restriction, even between zero and one, that is sufficient to say that, yeah, okay, in principle, there could be a stronger law of uh, generalized laws of thermodynamics. Uh, okay, I don't believe in this generalized laws of thermodynamics, I should just say, but, but you know, they postulated it and we have found a sort of uh, place where we can, you know, sh calculate these exactly, solve exactly, actually. Okay, I will say that instead of telling that the general laws of thermodynamics, yeah. you can say it is generalized thermodynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think there are groups of people who study that, actually. Uh, yeah. This thing, yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah. Study of these systems show, yeah. In fact, in that paper, what we did is we studied a lot of systems uh, actually, and we saw, saw that indeed um, it is prohibited. I mean, uh, what is allowed by the uh, you know sec, uh, second law, the usual second law, alpha is equal to one. Uh, sometimes some transition is prohibited by the second law, and I'll show you an example actually for the temperature, two temperatures. You remember, uh, like we could find that holomorphic deformation. Uh, uh, in which you shift the temperature by just adding stress tensor to the action. Uh, so for a CFT at temperature theta, T prime in contact with bath at T. So T prime greater than T and it's non-equilibrium process. Okay. Uh, so T prime going to T and the material of the bath is the same as T. And so usually and gradually, of course, T prime will go into uh, T because T prime is uh, higher and uh, the bath is T, uh, which is at lower temperature. Now, if you go through the traditional conventional second law, uh, because you know uh, you you know because it's non-equilibrium, it, you can allow lower temperatures. But the lower temperature T prime uh, uh, traditional, which is all the transitions which are allowed, have to lie between two T minus T prime. T prime is the higher temperature. It's like basically the midpoint. T double prime plus T prime is the average of the T. So it's like conduction. I mean. Uh, there are two, uh, the bath is at T and, uh, you know, what you are allowed uh, to go to at the minimum has to be, you know, such that the average is at the bath. Okay. So that's the conventional uh, law. And now if you go through this generalized thing, actually, uh, it turns out to be the geometric uh, mean, actually. So T double prime, uh, uh, what you're allowed to, uh, what all the transitions are allowed to have to lie between T squared by, it has to be greater than T squared by T prime. And T generalized is greater than T tradition because arithmetic mean is, I mean, is greater than geometric mean. Yeah. yeah uh, so, and that's why some transitions are allowed. But okay, this is some, yeah, it's a sort of speculative thing. Um, but okay, but you can apply these things to test, uh, apply these exact calculations we have to this test this. Uh, so now, uh, so that was a simple class in which the deformations were uh, commuting with the Hamiltonian. Now let's stick with this thing only. Again, the cylinder, you have the same picture in mind, the cylinder with two different Hamiltonians, one for uh, alpha beta and the one minus alpha beta. Now uh, let's take uh, example of non-commuting Hamiltonians. Okay. Now here's a very simple one. Uh, it's a toy example actually, uh, which we, we all study in, uh, in, in class, I mean, in quantum mechanics class. Uh, so this is the Hamiltonian, you think uh, I'm written the Lagrangian, but can think in Hamiltonian also. Uh, so this is an oscillator uh, with a, a forcing term, deformed oscillator with a forcing term. And uh, so now you think of the partition function of this oscillator in which part of it uh, is with the forcing, that rho, and part of it is without the forcing. And what's the distance between these two density matrices? What's the divergence or the distance between the two density matrices? Okay, and this is a uh, exactly solvable problem. Okay, so as we said that this is the Euclidean quench, part of it is uh, in which this is turned on and part of it is turned off. It's a quantum mechanics problem. Okay, and uh, you can actually evaluate this. Uh, you know, there is an exercise in Feynman and Hibbs 
and which is where if you use that you can evaluate this problem exactly actually and this is the answer uh, this is the answer between uh, the you know relative entropy alpha relative entropy between uh, a row a density matrix of the harmonic oscillator in which uh, uh, it's turned on for a while uh, and uh, the usual thermal density of the harmonic oscillator and uh, you can see uh, the mu uh, the turning on strength uh, is coming linearly quadratically there and there is a very nice alpha dependence uh, uh, of an omega as a frequency of the oscillator m is the mass so there is this nice uh, dependence in alpha okay and what we will see is that this simple problem this dependence in alpha uh, is universal for a class of problems such so what we will see is it's universal for a large class of problems okay. just just yeah. A, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. basically when we evaluate this path integral for such a yeah. uh, harmonic oscillator, oscillator. Yeah. path integral contributes uh, a const the constant term in the path integral it's a sine function but is it because of yeah. the Euclidean time we are considering it is coming as sine hyperbolic? Yeah, 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 that's correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 because of the Euclidean, yeah, yeah, that's correct. And uh, this is actually a quadratic problem. In the path integral language, this is quadratic problem, and, and you can integrate it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, but it's what is interesting is this behavior, and uh, this behavior is actually universal for a class of problems. And it was surprising that, uh, yeah, how we know how we arrived at it was also like when we found it was surprising. And so let's take this uh, point that sup uh, suppose mu would have become zero. This is consistent with the, what we discussed earlier. It's like a tree theory, something it does not right. contradict. Yeah, right? yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we yeah. This Entropy yeah. zero. Yeah. Right, okay. right. Uh, mu is equal to zero. Yeah, the two density matrices are the same, so there is no distance between them. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so this that class of that is very simple uh, problem in which the you know the oscillator is deformed like that is uh, uh, you will see that same behavior in many systems now. So uh, now you take CFT, okay, A CFT uh, size of L, and you deform it with the Hamiltonian of this kind. Uh, so here, you remember, we always deformed with just T naught naught or T Z Z, the usual term. But now you give uh, how much uh, spatial dependence to it, and, and you know that this is like e to the i two pi l x minus e to the power of my, uh, plus e to the power of minus two pi l x. And then when you do the Fourier analysis, the one actually gives l naught plus l naught bar. Okay, you can write it in terms of uh, you know if you write it in terms of T naught naught in terms of Virasoro generators, it will be l naught plus l naught naught. And then this e to the power of two pi x, e to the power of two pi, are different Fourier modes, and essentially the Hamiltonian, uh, this Hamiltonian has become L one plus L minus one, and anti-holomorphic L one bar minus L minus bar. And okay, on a cylinder there is a C by twelve. So this uh, is a class of deformation in which, uh, of course, again the Hamil this deformation does not commute with the original Hamiltonian L not plus L not bar. Uh, and uh, let us look at this class of problems. Okay. And uh, so we need to compute this. You can see this computation. So alpha beta uh, trace of uh, this is the deformed Hamiltonian. Okay, you see G, G is there and this is the deformed. This part, one minus alpha part is undeformed. Okay. And it's completely Virasoro uh, thing, everything is there. And we have to evaluate this in any CFT. Okay. So the answer is for any CFT, we're going, we want to evaluate this. Now, uh, how will we evaluate this thing? Okay. Uh, of course, we can do perturbation theory. We can do one by one. But there is a simple, there is a way of seeing this, actually. Uh, let us see that. Uh, so uh, let's focus just on the holomorphic, actually. This anti-holomorphic, keeping that is just a distraction because the fa things factorize, and then we can look at only the holomorphic. So we have L0, GL minus 1, uh, and uh, C by 12, or C by 24, if you take part of it. And uh, anyway, we'll ignore this for the time being. And there is the L naught here. So uh, we need to evaluate e to the power of two pi i alpha beta uh, uh, L naught and the deformed one, L minus one, L one, uh, and uh, one minus alpha undeformed one. Now these are exponentials, elements of the SL two algebra. Okay, all these are part of the SL two R algebra. Okay, if people know, I mean this. Uh, CFT, the global part, L0, L1, L minus 1, 
they form an SL2 algebra. And in fact, using Becker Hausdorff identity, because they don't commute, no? Uh, if, if they commuted, we could put them together like the old, old case. Yeah. They don't commute. Uh, so we have this exponential and then we have this. And then uh, use Becker Hausdorff, imagine using it. Uh, so therefore, there is this A, E to the A, E to the B. And then you can write e to the a plus b commutator, commutator of e to, nested commutators. So all this forms nested commutators. Now, when you do nested commutators, it will just be part of this is a subalgebra. You see, l naught, l minus one, l one. Okay, uh, they will go into each other. Okay. Uh, so they will be, become. Just curiosity yes. here again. Yeah. Have you carefully? You carefully have chosen. Or to deform yeah. it by L minus one and L one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course they don't come out to it L zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I'm afraid that if you go for uh, this particular set, because we know that the vacuum is yeah. uh, invariant uh, on, on yeah. this set, on this SL2, the moment I go yeah. for R yeah. L minus two, et cetera, which will keep track of the full energy momentum tensor. Yeah. Assume yeah. that would be that much easy. Yeah, that, yeah, that would be harder. It <laughs> will be harder. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, there is again every. Uh, okay, we'll see. I, I'll show you what, what can be generalized soon. Actually, so, possibly those things should be considered again as perturbation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I should tell you the story. What? What's? I'll tell you the story a little bit later. Once we I complete okay. this part, I'll tell you the story. So. Uh, so we uh, we sort of uh, yeah so we can exponentiate it and it is am lm now how to find this am is the proper thing right uh, so uh, uh, so uh, so the baker hausdorff identity involves only nested commutators okay and uh, therefore there is we see the relation between uh, so what we have initially is you know g beta alpha and somehow we have to relate am to all these things so that yeah. just seems complicated uh, but it just depends on the structure constants of the algebra you know because uh, what we have is always the nested uh, commutators and that just depends on the structure constants of the algebra okay and at a practical level you can work it out because it just depends on the structure constants of the algebra using a finite dimensional matrix representation of sl2 r and uh, that's what we do. Uh, so we take this e to the power, uh, and then okay. So once once you find these AMs, you, you can find the AMs one, because you you just uh, put them together, and uh, you know you ask this side to be the same as this side, and you can indeed find AMs. It'll be a complicated expression, but once you have this form AM LM, you can rotate it to L naught uh, by uh, uh, by M element like this. Uh, by an element like this, you can rotate it back to L naught. It's like going to the z-axis, and this can be always done uh, because uh, uh, you can rotate uh, this vector. This is almost like SU two, but uh, yeah. it's, uh, but it is you know you have to rotate it in such a way that the Cartan killing norm is preserved. Not just the you know in the SU two case you have to preserve the usual norm, uh, but here you have to preserve that norm, and uh, and you know. And then the yeah using the Cartan killing norm is just a naught squared minus a plus a minus so uh, so what happens is that finally and you're taking the trace so yeah. since you're taking the trace this m doesn't matter so all you have to do is find this yeah uh, and so that is what you do and you can find this and basically now if you see the partition function just is the same partition function but it's the temperature is rescaled. That's right. The yeah. temperature is rescaled by the beta. No, and you can find that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so this is the formula actually uh, for the at least still g squared order. You can keep working it out. Uh, okay. So here I have to tell the story a little bit. So the thing is, when we wrote the paper first, yeah. Uh, what we did was we just brought this down in perturbation theory, like Sudhakar was saying for l minus two, you'll have to do all that. So we just brought this down in perturbation theory and just did perturbation theory because we know the algebra we kept commuting it and we just did the perturbation theory and we got the answer we got this answer of course but uh, of course we have to send it to a referee right so the referee writes you know you can do this abstract argument this karta and you can rotate it and so on and then we develop that argument also and uh, both ways we get the same answer of course it's, i mean we did the perturbation theory rightly and uh, it turned out both ways we get the same answer yeah
uh, and uh, so uh, so since its uh, temperatures just change, so we can easily evaluate the correction uh, for the partition function, and then we can use all that information to find the relative entropy. And you see, uh, this is what is very nice. So you see that that alpha dependence of the relative entropy is exactly the same as the harmonic oscillator. That part. That's right. Is exactly the same. There's some other parts which is depending on the CFT and all, but this part that that coupling perturbation and this part is exactly the same as the uh, the compound oscillator. And uh, uh, so we have checked, uh, as I said, yeah, checked. I've said checked is the same result using, but actually we did this first, and then the referee said you can do this abstract thing, and uh, that's how we developed that. And we did it for the spin three. This part actually forms a subalgebra. It's, it's like I said, we need a subalgebra, yes. Uh, and we did this for this, and then again, it turned out to be the same. Okay. Uh, uh, so we have for spin s, in fact, uh, it, it has the same structure. Now, uh, uh, so on studying this, actually, when you see it in perturbation theory, you can see the mechanism why the same answer comes. The same answer comes because the deformed uh, CFT, undeformed Hamiltonian, and these operators which we are deforming by, they form a Heisenberg algebra. Like they have this H naught LK is equal to minus LK. Like L naught L1 is minus L1. And L1, L naught L minus one is L1. And uh, similarly for this. And this harmonic oscillator also has the same thing. A dagger A, A is plus minus A dagger. Yeah, plus minus slash plus minus. So they form ha they have the same algebra. And when you do this perturbation theory, uh, to this level, only this Heisenberg algebra matters. And uh, that's the reason these answers are very universal. Now, uh, so though it's such a nice result, uh, we haven't actually used it. And our goal was, I mean, I, we haven't developed it yet, is to use this because it's universal. And it just, at least for the Verasero, you see, uh, it just depends on the global part. So if we can set up, uh, something in gravity in which we have this kind of quench process, we should be able to see this actually, uh, but we, ha we haven't gone that far. So this paper just has uh, this observation and yeah, we haven't gone to that uh, level. It's possible, David, because yeah. now, now that you have gone at least for the subaljabra of the W symmetry, yeah. Yeah. then it should not be difficult actually, at least within the subaljabra to connect with gravity. Because yeah, you know yeah. this gravity, etc. Those yeah. things are basically described by this uh, W algebra. Yeah, W algebra. Yes, yeah. It should be possible. Yeah, even the Virasero case, you know, just for yeah. the VTZ black hole. Yes, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's it, difficult to yeah. uh, connect to gravity. But yeah. moment we have brought in at least the finite sub algebra part of W3 gravity, yeah. that should be possible. It's not it should be possible. Yeah, gravity, yeah. But it, some sort of Restricted gravity yeah. theory is impossible. Yeah, it should be possible. Yeah, we haven't gone uh, to that actually. Then, uh, yeah, we went to the other question. We'll come back. I mean, hopefully, we'll come. Yeah, I'll have the strength to come back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very that this directorship has spoiled my life. Yeah. I have not been touch with this uh, one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. It's. Uh, yeah. I, I'm also having lesser time. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah now that you are dean, you have also lesser time. Yeah. But fortunately, yeah. I have only science. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so that was the observation. So let's go back to the other class of problems, uh, which we started out with, in which we had these excitations. And then, you know, uh, we calculated these, uh, you know, this entanglement entropy uh, and, um, and relative entropy using this replica trick. We had this infinite uh, 2n, uh, 2n wedges, and we had these 2n correlators. And then we we'll, let's go to the descendant case actually, uh, and uh, let's see what is the pattern. And you remember e to the ikx when we did it was zero. The entanglement uh, there was no entanglement uh, entropy for it. Uh, and now consider the uh, density matrix of a level uh, one descendant, which is this del O. And what's the entanglement entropy of this for the single interval, and how does it compare with primary? Uh, so. Uh, recall, we saw that that for the entanglement one needed to evaluate two endpoint function on the uniformized plane. Uh, so therefore, uh, and you remember there was a conformal transformation for it. When we did the two end, there was a conformal transformation. And for the primary, it was just high, uh, W prime, the, the derivative of the Jacobian thing. Now here, if you evaluate for the del, 
it's uh, complicated. I mean, you get you get this similar homogeneous transformation W prime to the H plus one, and then uh, you have this inhomogeneous one. So del W actually under conformal transformation go to O and del W. Okay, and then you have to put this uh, you know two n times like that. And if you look at all the correlators you have to do, you have to do two to the two n correlators uh, uh, to evaluate. And this has to be uh, evaluated on that you know wedge thing, and then take an n going to one limit. So you know the problem becomes more and more uh, complicated, actually, uh, as you go to higher descendants. Uh, but I, I, okay, we'll see the things which we have done later. And uh, so let's go back to this del of e to the i k x, which Sudhakar asked first. And you remember the e to the ikx correlator was known, a two endpoint function was known, it is this. Now, uh, let me define these quantities, a, b's, and so on. It's all because of the slopes. You see, there is, you remember, there's w prime, there was a slope. Now we need w double prime, the second slope of, of that transformation. Okay. And all this is related to that. And uh, so the correlator for this is essentially this. So you had this F, which is the original correlator. And then because of the derivative, you have to act derivatives of that on the correlator. And, uh, and we have to calculate this function. So the correlator, essential correlator is this. So it becomes uh, really uh, messy, but uh, we can open it up actually. And, uh, and there is a way of organizing all the terms, uh, which is what we did. It's a way of organizing all the terms. And uh, what is amazing is that when you do that, uh, it, it actually organizes uh, uh, into correlators of uh, currents, just currents, del x. Um, so it's basically uh, del x, many del x, 2n, uh, 2n point function of just del x. Because some of the e to the i k x is not contributing. Uh, it can be shown, you know, identity. Once you evaluate it and set these points at zero and infinity, and um, uh, and you evaluate this, uh, you will actually get. Uh, you can actually show that the correlator, uh, you know, becomes correlated function of del x, and then um, uh, the entanglement entropy. When you evaluate, uh, there is a formula. So it, uh, so it's this two n point function with this uh, currents one by z one minus z two uh, like to the two because it's weight one current. Uh, and uh, you go ahead uh, and you organize all that. Uh, okay, it's a, it's a complicated correlator, but you can still organize them. Okay. And uh, the C correlator is, can be written like this as a determinant, uh, to n cross to n determinant. And uh, um, yeah, so there's a formula. Uh, luckily, this determinant has been evaluated earlier by Calabrese and these guys. Uh, they have evaluated it and uh, it turns out to be final formula turns out to be this formula in which you can take n going to one limit. That's what's amazing. And um, you get this nice, uh, this function. Uh, it, it is not negative though. It looks like this. It's not negative. Uh, so it's, it's a function like this. Uh, and, uh, and if you plot it, it actually looks like this. You, here there's a nice thing to show. Uh, of course, when the interval is small, there is no entanglement. It grows. To the midpoint, uh, and then of course, uh, when the whole interval is taken, of course, there's no entanglement, and that is demonstrated by this thing, and it's positive. Uh, so this is one of the exactly solvable cases, but not many, you know. Uh, del squared, I think uh, we cannot go with this present technology. So, but we develop something else uh, after that. Uh, so using just this input now, we can evaluate various things: the relative entropy between del e to the ikx, and so on. Um, there is this formula again using evaluating the two endpoint functions uh, with the descendant. Uh, you can see. But what is interesting is that you see the primary was just nothing, was nothing. But once the Virasero generator or the derivative acts on it, uh, there's a non trivial function. Uh, there's a non trivial function. So, you know, this thing has not been explored. The exploration of uh, entanglement entropy and how, uh, when you act by symmetry generators, how the entanglement changes. Uh, that has not been explored uh, actually very much. Uh, and it is non-trivial, the change is non-trivial um, in this. Uh, so in fact, the entanglement Hamiltonian can be evaluated and it just shifts. I mean, Hamiltonian has a nice property. It just shifts the original one by one because del acts 
increases the weight by one and, and it shifts uh, by one. And uh, various yeah, other relevant property between descendant and the primary can be evaluated. And that, that also, there is some function. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a Hamiltonian. So basically the descendant just behaves like a weight one operator for in terms of intact, for the entanglement Hamiltonian, at least it behaves just like that. Now, but these are very special cases. Uh, and, uh, you know, you want to develop some very general things, uh, more general things, and at least something which we can take for other CFTs. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, so that's what we try to do. But then we have to limit. We might not be able to get the full function on the cylinder, but maybe the short distance can we, uh, you know, uh, uh, develop some techniques uh, like perturbation theory in short distance, um, and. Uh, can we use that? And also when you have short distance, it's easier to study holographically because short distance is some small interval on the boundary and the geodesic, which is used generally by Rio Takanagi just goes a little bit interior. And so we don't need to know the full solutions and so on. So that's why we developed short distance. And also those two endpoint functions, they are known for very few CFTs. So uh, we developed short distance expansion and, uh, and actually we have developed in general, but I will show you the results for something called generalized free fields. And generalized free fields are, uh, uh, are free fields which are seen, people believe, I mean, actually there are evidence, there is evidence uh, that generalized free fields are the fields uh, which, uh, which operators are there in the bulk, meaning a gravity, a theory which has gravity and you have a boundary operator of dimension H, then there is a scalar uh, minimally coupled scalar in the bulk, which is a dual two. And, uh, and if you calculate its correlators and so on, uh, it behaves like a generalized free field, at least in this large n kind of, or large C limit. So what is it? Basically, you have these two endpoint functions and uh, usually it's very complicated, but in gravity, uh, in the large n limit, it actually factorizes uh, and into two, uh, you know, various pairwise contractions of the two endpoint functions. Meaning if you have four, for instance, you contract this two, then you contract this two. You contract this and you contract this two. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is called a generalized free fields. Of course, for like free bosons, free fermions, that's how it works, right? If you take psi psi, you contract this, then you contract this. Uh, but in the large end limit, uh, this factorization happens. Uh, and uh, 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 and uh, you know that is the motivation for looking at this particular class of uh, fields uh, uh, for holography because eventually uh, our goal eventually is to check uh, with holography and that's why we are developing this class of uh, things and uh, uh, again uh, so uh, so uh, the leading order contribution in the short distance when you think about it so you remember you had this picture okay let's go back to that actually uh, so it will slow down some things also a little bit. Uh, so let's, uh, I know I'm going and uh, taking some time, but still, uh, let me go back so that the picture is very clear to tell. Yeah, so this two endpoint function, you remember, was this thing. Uh, so we had two endpoint functions, yeah. Now in the short distance limit, you know, when X is very small, okay, so we, we, we just, we contract these two. We, we, we do pairwise with contractions of only two of these guys, each two like that. We just factorize them like that. We take two here, uh, contract them and two uh, contract them like that. And uh, N of them, we just raise to the power. That's the leading approximation, okay? And I will tell you the next leading approximation we do. Uh, but this is the leading approximation, just pairwise the contraction of each of them. Instead of this two endpoint function, just to pairwise only among the wedges. Don't talk to the other wedges. So that's the leading uh, contribution. And, um, okay, sorry for this, but I just wanted to uh, show the picture. Should I put the picture again? So, yeah, so that's the leading contra uh, contribution. Uh, so that's what I said. It's just a pairwise contraction on the same, same sheet or the same wedge. Uh, and uh, that is easy. For primaries, it is easy. And you can calculate that um, because it's just two and uh, two point functions. Basically, we are reducing it to two point functions. Uh, and in fact, the entanglement entropy is just this. 
Okay, that's the uh, same functions are coming. Okay, uh, now uh, if you do it for the descendant, okay, actually this is wrong. This is no descendant here. Uh, oh, uh, uh, so and uh, in fact uh, there are some properties. Maybe I should just leave this. I think we can evaluate the relative entropy, relative Hamiltonian with this approximation. Uh, let's just leave that. Uh, now uh, here, so so here is this uh, thing. Uh, when you evaluate it for the descendant. Okay, uh, so you get this correction, just the short distance. So this is a contraction, two point function in the same wedge. So you get this correction. Now this correction is interesting actually. This correction is, you see, if you see it carefully, this correction goes as n minus one squared. Now, if it is n minus one squared, then uh, it doesn't affect the entanglement entropy. Now, so therefore the descendant, level one descendant, when you do, uh, this correction doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't go, I mean, it, it doesn't correct the entanglement entropy. It only this much is enough. This is n minus one squared order. And this property we worked out to level three, all the states to level three, uh, we worked out. And uh, it is the same property that, you know, uh, if you do the same wedge contractions, there's no corrections uh, uh, to the entanglement entropy. And uh, so the leading contribution uh, is just as though, the weight just increases by one. We saw that in the free theory also, uh, but the weight uh, it just increases by one. Okay, uh, and actually we've now gone to level three. Actually, <laughs> we haven't developed a proof, but we have gone to level three. Okay, and uh, so uh, yeah, so but it doesn't have much structure. But so let's go to uh, the corrections to this. So right now we contracted uh, in the same wedge. Uh, so now the next systematic correction is when you contract n minus two uh, operators, contract uh, n minus two uh, uh, on the same wedge, uh, the last uh, four operators on the two wedges, label it as jj prime, kk prime as positions, that uh, you contract all possible contractions like jj prime, this is the same wedge contraction, but then jk prime, kj prime, jk and jk prime. So what you do is basically imagine that wedge. So there are n wedges, contract n minus two among themselves. And the remaining n minus uh, the four fellows, you contract all sorts of ways, okay? What you initially did was only contract in the same wedge, but you contract all sorts of ways, okay? So that leads to the subleading corrections actually. And uh, you can evaluate that uh, subleading thing. And uh, there is a way, and you have to sum over all the pairs, i, j, k, like that. And uh, you can do that. Um, and uh, the correction is this. It just depends on the weight. Uh, and uh, you can evaluate the entanglement of it's again positive. Um, so, uh, so there is a correction like this. Now, uh, we can go to level two, okay? A level uh, descendant del squared O minus, even the level one, but let me look at level two. Level two, there are two states, which is like L minus one squared uh, on the operator and L minus two on the operator. Okay. And uh, we can calculate it. Uh, and O minus, we need, of course, the conformal transformation of that O minus two is quite complicated, but it can be worked out. Uh, here it is. Uh, it can be worked out. And, um, and using all the inputs, you can correct. So del O, for instance, just correct, gets correct this. This is actually an interesting coefficient, I'll point out. So these coefficients keep get changing. You see, the primary had only this. This is the correction. Uh, and now we get these coefficients in front. And the weight also changes, of course, because the weight changes. Uh, these coefficients in front, this case, the rest all say, stay the same. Now, del squared gets another coefficient. O minus two gets another coefficient here. The central charge also comes here. Okay, O minus two involves the stress tensor and that's how the central charge comes. So these coefficients keep changing. So what is this? Is there a pattern or what? Uh, so, uh, and if you calculate the relative entropy, uh, because of this change in these coefficients, uh, you get this squared. Okay, you get this particular combination squared. This is depending on the weight of the operators and central charge, okay, this squared. Now, is there anything guess, to it? Uh, this, uh, yeah. the, uh, can you go to the previous slide? Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. yeah. Why this uh, like uh, for O2 this kind of terms? It's it's because of the Schwarzian or something like that. Yeah, there is a yeah because O minus two. You see, O minus two is L minus two on O. Uh, and how do you get that? Uh, it's got by the OPE between T O. So this is the definition of O minus two, the descendant at level two. Uh, T is there. You see, stress tensor is fused in. See, K is equal to two. K is equal to two. So it's the finite term in the T O O P. Okay, it's a finite term. So it's stress tensor is fused there. And so if you calculate co correlator, that stress tensor part comes, and that's how the central charge comes. Mm -hmm. And also you can uh, you can see it in the conformal transformation. You see C. Mm -hmm. C is coming. Okay, True. That's how the C comes. Yeah. Uh, the 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 global descendants don't have that, and it just is just H. Yeah. So um, uh, so you have this, and this is very interesting thing. How it, uh, this thing it, right now it doesn't look interesting, but soon it will turn out. So uh, it is this. Um, uh, let's look at the cast determinant at level two. Okay. Uh, people in CFT know what the Cartes determinant is. It's basically the inner products of all the states at level two. So L minus two, L minus two of a weight primary like this. Uh, L minus two with a cross, L minus one squared. Oh, okay, this is L minus one dagger squared, L minus two, and uh, L minus one dagger squared, uh, L minus two, L minus two. This turns out to be this. Now, what is the determinant of this guy? Four H plus C into this minus six X squared, right? And uh, and that is this actually. If you, I mean, the six x squared is there, and this is that other term, actually. So the 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 relative, uh, you know, entropy between level two states is actually the cast. It's proportional to the cast determinant actually uh, at level two, uh, and we have checked it using another information theory measure that uh, it's uh, proportional with the cast determinant squared. And uh, also, as I said, for the global descendant, you see these numbers, it doesn't depend on central charge, you see these numbers coming out for it squared and so on. And uh, actually, in general, this one we have verified generally, that uh, at the global descendant ln to the O, uh, you know, it's this of course gets shifted by n. And this coefficient is actually the norm of that state. Okay. And uh, uh, so uh, the norm of the state uh, and the global descendants actually are, are basically uh, you know isometries in in ADS and uh, you know we hope that we can verify such things in holography. I will tell you a little bit more about that uh, soon. Uh, so these are the patterns we have observed. I mean we have not written all these things up. These are in progress actually. Uh, so these are the patterns we have seen so far uh, in these descendant uh, computation in the short distance limit. Okay. Um, uh, it is interesting. I mean, in, the, in fact, the cast determinant coming out is quite a surprise. Uh, the, this, it somehow controls the distance between two level two primaries. Um, so at present, we are planning to generalize these observations to, uh, to Virasura descendants at arbitrary level. I don't know how far we'll be successful, but we will try. And, um, and, uh, and so also of just the vacuum, what is the descendant of the vacuum? Uh, you know, uh, is there some property? Of that, that itself we are trying to study, uh, and uh, why is sort of um, why is this sort of uh, holographically uh, useful, and we that is our goal eventually. Actually, so this leading short distance um, expansion uh, for the primaries. Okay, so let me go back. At least for these, uh, you know, the generalized free fields. So the primary was this, was this. Huh? So there is this term plus this term for this excited state. Uh, of weight h. Now this thing has been reproduced in holography uh, by those authors. It was very, uh, very involved uh, calculation, and it was done only numerically so far as I know uh, by these authors, Pellin, Iqbal, and Lokande in 2018. Uh, so and uh, they use this, uh, you know, proposal by this uh, Falkner, Lokner, Smeltesena for evaluating the entanglement entropy in the bulk. And it was quite calcul uh, involved, actually. You had, uh, you had uh, the Ryu Takanagi surface. And because of this excitation, you had to correct that Ryu Takanagi uh, you know, surface. And you had to even, because this is this, you know, the subleading correction is actually one loop. And you had to calculate one loop. And it's, it was very involved, actually. And uh, to calculate this, you can see the paper. It's worth actually looking. It's actually worth, if you are thinking about students, and it's worth having a general club on that paper. And um, 
it was involved a calculation, but they could reproduce that uh, term, that correction, short distance correction. And uh, now we have a generalization of that, uh, at least in this class, uh, generalization for, um, for the global descendants. And global descendants, as I said, is this global Virasaro, global part of the Virasaro, and that is isometries in ADS. That's just the SL2R times SL2R part of the ADS three. Uh, and, uh, and we hope actually, at least we could see that, we could generalize these people's calculation to, uh, to sort of see that actually. Uh, so uh, that is one of our goals actually. Uh, so maybe I will just include that uh, reasonably interesting structures to find uh, by studying information theory quantities in CFT. Yeah. yeah. So that's that, that that's sort of what I have to say, actually. Okay. Justin, uh, I yeah. have a couple of remarks now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as we saw that in the primary case, there is no correction to the entropy. Yeah. But um, suppose. Yeah, actually, there is the short distance one uh, that is for the e to the ikx. But yeah. for a general case operator, actually, there is a short distance correction okay. like this. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. what I was thinking is that, for example, the uh, <clears throat> suppose you would have taken n equal to two when in your right. sliding into the wedges. Yeah, yeah. Then I would have I would have got actually basically four point correlation function. Right, right, right. Yeah. And the four point correlation function we have the crossing symmetry from CFT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does it say? How does it set some light on the entropy side? Yeah. Or even what we call generalized thermodynamics. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that part of the story I haven't told you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, because you know it, uh, how much. Yeah. In fact, when you do this, uh, uh, this for this was for a generalized free fields. You know, because I just used weak contraction for the four point function. Okay. Remember, I took four of them separately, and I just used weak contraction. Yeah. Uh, for it because I kept n separately and I looked at the four and even if you just do directly four as Sudhakar is saying you'll just get these four weak contractions here but for a generalized general CFT arbitrary CFT you have to use a full four point function there yes and there you have to use conformal blocks or you have yes. to, you can write it in some form actually yeah uh, and that structure we have actually got I haven't presented it I mean uh, but yeah I haven't presented it anything that we have already that, that, that already exists in the paper? Yeah, in, what we are doing, yeah, it will come out <laughs> when it will come. Yeah, yeah, but that structure is there. Yeah, yeah. Connect to the bootstrap, etc. Yeah, we haven't connected it, but we have pointed out that, yeah, uh, you know, these are four point functions which can be fixed by conformal. We haven't, we have just shown the connection. We have shown the connection that, yeah, yeah. And the so, second remark is that uh, suppose I would have also the Katzmody symmetry. Right, right, yeah. Okay. Then, yeah. Can we connect them to yeah. this uh, information theory measures, yeah. etc.? Because that's a bigger yeah, that, yeah, that I think is a good question. Because you know uh, this uh, this problem, this e to the i k x. When I took the del, so it, yeah, the, yeah, yeah it became a u one current. Yeah, u one current uh, correlators. Yeah. Now, yeah, I think those answers will, and we got a very nice function for that. The full function could be done. So for Katsmudi, yeah, it, yeah, it will be interesting. Uh, what is that function? I mean, to yeah, get, yeah. But I, yeah. I'll be interested, interested to know yeah. about that, what happens yeah. with this. Yeah. Because you've gone yeah. from Virasoro to W, but yeah. even in the Virasoro sector, uh, if we want to have uh, some other current algebra, even smaller, small, simplest one like SU2, let's say, what extra yeah. things we can learn right. from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's. Um, yeah. I mean, this kind of like using symmetry operators to generate entanglement. Yeah, it's not been studied very much actually. Yeah, maybe recently yeah. only people are looking. But at the it. full entanglement story, no one talks about current algebra. Yeah, yeah. Yet they found a platform to ask such questions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. This, um, yeah. Okay, shall I stop, Justin? Yeah, yeah. Shall I stop sharing? I think. Yes. Because, yeah, you can stop sharing. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, wait. People might be asking questions. Let's separate. Oh, oh, okay. Then I can bring it back, yeah. actually. Yeah. So, fortunately, it was after 6 30, still I have to leave my office at 6 o'clock. Generally, I come at 8 o'clock. Oh, some. I enjoyed the talk and. Uh, yeah, yeah.
all this reading this okay. one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. So uh, thank yeah. you, Justin, for giving such a yeah. elaborative, nice talk on the subject. Yeah. And I'm okay, yeah. pretty sure that the, uh, this will be helpful for the students. Okay, yeah, and that is so, yeah, one of my goals, <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah because, uh, yeah. So if yeah. anybody have any particular question regarding his talk, please ask. I can see that people left because it is already uh, long. Yeah. But right, yeah. Uh, yes, I see. I saw one guy, Sachin. Sachin, do you have any question? Yeah, I, I can't hear actually. It's breaking. I don't know. Maybe. I, I can't hear. Yeah. Now Shall I stop my video? Maybe then, uh, then maybe it'll be clear. Sure, sure, sure. No problem. Yeah, so if there uh, is a question, uh, is, is there any question from anybody who is attending? If not, then just thanks Justin by unmuting yourself. And I can't hear actually. Uh, I mean, it's breaking very much. Justin, can you hear me? I can hear properly. I think there is a problem yeah. from his yeah. end. Any, okay. Anyways, I uh, just need to... You can it. write the question. I mean, in case he wants to write to me, he can write to me, actually, uh, if he's not able to ask now. Yeah, you please, if you have any question, please write to Justin. Uh, he will be happy to give the answers. And uh, thank you, Justin. And... Uh, um, yeah, I just need to say, uh, like, uh, give a clap for your good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, stay safe and healthy and uh, see you again sometime with yeah. new results. Right, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Bye. Bye.